So it's the case that some number of years ago, a new paradigm perhaps began to emerge, something that's become known as, as cloud computing. And this is, this is not necessarily a new concept, it's something that, that has its roots from uh, long ago, but, but it, is, it, it has changed significantly in recent years. So we've seen companies like uh, Amazon and Google that have developed systems that need to handle a scale that we've never been able to deal with before. And so, um, so this, this notion of, of internet scale is, is one of the factors that, that gave rise to cloud computing. So if you look at, at uh, uh, companies like Amazon, an online retailer, they need to handle variable business. So it's the case that whether it's the Christmas sales cycle or for some special reason, suddenly the usage will, will spike and they need to be able to ramp up in order to handle that. Uh, and at other times, the volume of their business is not going to be so significant. And so they need some way that's going to allow them to, to expand in order to support the need. If you think about the typical process in old data centers where you would need to add physical computers, then it's a fairly significant amount of effort in order to add a computer. So you'll have to order it, you'll have to get approval, you'll have to go through the procurement process, you'll have to add, uh, um, uh, you'll have to add software and add the data and, and harden the computer uh, and then deploy it. And so this might be a one or two month process, certainly much too long to respond to uh, to immediate spikes in, in usage. And so uh, alternately, you, uh, you started to see organizations begin to virtualize their environment. And uh, so Amazon was, was one of the companies that, that, uh, uh, that made heavy use of virtualization. Google is another one. In, in addition, they had many, many physical nodes to support their infrastructure. So the volume was very large. They had lots of computers. The number of computers that they had was so large that they were guaranteed to see failures with regularity. And so rather than having very expensive, highly reliable systems, instead they designed their systems to deal with failure. And so they had uh, commodity hardware. In fact, they typically buy uh, mid-level to low-level hardware and they set up their systems to deal with physical failure with regularity. So some number of their systems fail every day and they're removed and replaced. So for this reason, their environment was very dynamic. Uh, and this gave rise to the capability to be able to support this, among, among other things. Uh, gave rise to the capability to support uh, um, something that we've be that's become known as cloud computing. And so this, again, is an old idea where, much like a utility, when you switch on a light, the electricity is going to be there. If you need more electricity, then you, the, the electricity will be available and you pay for the electricity that you use. A similar idea uh, is, now, is now prevalent for computing power. So the idea is that you rent computing power much like you would a utility. And so as you need more, more will be created. So as you have more users, more computing power will be available. And you'll pay for the computing power that you use. So rather than buying a physical device, so rather than having a power generator in your facility in order to produce the electricity, you will, you will buy electricity from somebody else that produces the power. The same idea uh, holds true in, in cloud computing. One of the things that's happened is it has drastically reduced deployment time. So you can develop and deploy a system without developing the infrastructure, without the expertise to have the infrastructure, and, and that decreases the amount of time that you need to deploy a system. Uh, organizations like Amazon have set themselves up in, in such a way that they've been able to deploy systems very rapidly. So if you look at the typical development cycle in many organizations, it's very short. It's one week or two weeks, which is much shorter than, than you see in other more traditional organizations. So if you look at organizations like think about producing the office suite for Microsoft, the, uh, you think about the, the time between major releases in Office, it's significant. It's some number of years. And many organizations would like to improve their their business agility. They would like to be able to release products more quickly. They would like to be able to release capability more quickly. And they, uh, they see cloud computing as a mechanism for doing that, for allowing them 
to release products much more quickly. But what they don't necessarily understand is that there's a relationship between the structure of the organization, uh, the technical environment, and the way you develop software. And so it's the case that oftentimes you are, in one way or another, inhibited by your, your organizational structure. You're inhibited by the way that you develop software. And those are the things that make it more difficult to release quickly or to start to have issues if you do try to release very quickly. And so we can take a couple of concrete examples and try to, try to understand why it's sometimes difficult. So one of the things, as I said before, that happens in cloud computing is that the environment is dynamic. So you don't know ahead of time what the physical environment is going to be. So you might deploy a system on a single node, and then that node will be automatically replicated. Uh, you might end up having hundreds or even thousands of nodes based on some configuration. At any point in time, you don't know how many nodes you have. You don't know what those nodes are or where they are. They're going to come and go dynamically based on the, the, uh, the configuration of the environment. And so what does that mean? That means that, that you're not going to be able to react manually to, uh, to situations in the same way that you would if you have a physical infrastructure that you have complete control over. So in the old world, when you had a data center and you had some number of physical computers, you knew what they were, you knew what the environment was, you would have administrators that would monitor and react to the situations in the environment. And to some extent, they, the, the infrastructure would react automatically, but to some extent, you would react manually. So as you started to see conditions occur, then you would, you would have people that would make physical changes. But when you don't understand what's happening in the environment, you can no longer, or your needs change very rapidly, you can no longer do that manually. You now have to start doing that automatically. That means that before you release the system, you don't really know what the, what the um, uh, deployment environment looks like exactly. So you're not necessarily able to predict all the conditions under which it's going to be operating. There are some other situations that will confound the problem. So there's this notion of multi-tenancy. So because you're no longer uh, dedicated to a physical computer, you now have virtualized infrastructure, other people are going to share the same physical resources. So you might have a number of virtual instances that are allocated to one physical instance. And so that means that the conditions that you see are going to be affected by others around you by other people that are, or other tenants that are using that physical infrastructure. So again, a number of things change if you think about the quality assurance process. So typically you're going to try to predict what the environment's going to be. You will try to test the system to, to understand how it will react under certain conditions. You will identify bugs when you go through the, the testing process. You'll fix those bugs and then you'll deploy the system and the system will be sort of left to run. You might apply patches periodically as you see additional issues, but to some extent your hope is that the released product is going to operate in a, in a, fairly, in a fairly consistent and stable way. When you're working in the, in the cloud, again, you can't predict what's going to happen once you start to release it. You can't predict the environment. You can't predict the other tenants that are going to, to participate. You can't, can't predict the impact of, of all of these factors. And so, and so if you try to uh, um, just release the product and let it go on its own, then you'll, you'll often have problems that you don't react to or don't react to well. Instead, what you need to do is set up some set of automated uh, activities to monitor and to react. And so this means that your quality assurance process moves from, from testing kind of offline and deploying to more of a live testing environment where you're going to uh, test the system under operating conditions. You're going to deploy the system, you're going to monitor it, and you're going to react to, um, uh, react to the, the conditions that you see as the system is operating. Um, and so that, that changes quality assurance activities. It's also going to change to some extent how you incentivize your employees. So if you think about organizations that have very long life cycles, they'll have project managers that are going to, that are going to be incentivized by maintaining schedule and budget. So they're going to be evaluated at the end of the year against 
the extent to which they were able to release a product on time and on budget. If it's the case that you're going to have a, an infrastructure that will automatically roll back a deployment if something goes wrong, then, then how do you consider uh, deployment time? Then it's the case that the project manager might be incentivized to maintain deployment even if the operating conditions are less than desirable for the organization. So you often want to come up with a different sort of incentive model that will make sure that your employees will, will react in a way that's uh, in the interest of the organization, that will ensure that you have measures that are established, that will uh, truly monitor how effective the system is going to be or the system is in operation, and that will respond in a way that, that support the interests of the, of the organization as opposed to supporting the incentives that, uh, um, that are measuring the performance of your individuals. So you want to make sure that these things are aligned. If it's the case that you need to coordinate releases, so if the architecture of the system is such that you've got many dependent parts, then you need to somehow make sure that any individual release that, uh, that happens is coordinated with other releases and that the associated monitoring is, uh, uh, is going to respond accordingly. So you don't want to roll back one critical piece of the system and have a number of other critical pieces be adversely affected. And so you need to coordinate across the organization or change the architecture so that you have decoupled, uh, decoupled very small um, microservices that are going to be able to be deployed and be rolled back without any, without any significant impact across the organization. And so for all those reasons, there are, there are a, number of, a number of factors that are, going to, um, that are going to affect, number one, business agility, and that are going to potentially need to change if you are going to uh, develop systems and deploy systems in the cloud. So those factors, again, include the organizational structure, the responsibilities of the employees, so project management, things like quality assurance and so forth. The, uh, the infrastructure to support that, so you need some set of automated tools to allow for testing and monitoring and so forth. You need to make sure that you have measures that are defined that are aligned with the organization's interests. So those measures are not likely going to be schedule and budget kinds of measures, but might be the number of orders processed or, or some other measure that is, that is uh, uh, aligned with the organizational interests. You want to make sure that the employees are incentivized in an appropriate way. That again, that, that helps to ensure that their actions are going to be consistent with the needs of the organization. You might need to change the architecture of the system. So rather than having one large, tightly coupled system that will have a number of dependent pieces that, uh, um, uh, that need to be coordinated, you might need to begin to decouple portions of the system so that they can be they can be deployed, monitored, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, handled from an operational perspective independently, and that actions taken on one piece of the system aren't going to adversely affect a number of other pieces. So these are all things that you want to evaluate before you think about the deploying or architecting in the cloud and uh, that are going to impact the kinds of benefits that you would see if you move from a more traditional computing environment into a cloud computing environment. <laughs>